I want to thank uh, Kai Hoffman for setting this conference up. Um, uh, it's the first time for many of us to be traveling, um, uh, particularly for us Canadians to come to Europe. It's been a bit of a challenge over the last you know, uh, year and a half or two years. Uh, so it's, and it's a lot of familiar faces, um, a lot of shareholders here. Uh, it's great seeing you all again for, it seems like a long time, and uh, hopefully we're getting a little bit back to normal and you know, these conferences and these visits you know, can continue on a more uh, regular basis. Um, what we're gonna do here with this format is I've got a quick presentation. It's only gonna be about 15 minutes or so, and then Kai and I are gonna just have a bit of a question and answer you know, with the crowd. So hopefully you know, if you got uh, some interesting questions for both of us, uh, we'll do our best to uh, uh, answer and entertain if at all possible. So I'll get right into it. So this is uh, you know, quite a famous photo uh, that was circulated around the internet. Uh, you know, many of you probably seen this photo. It came from um, Davos, um, you know, interesting, uh, each of these uh, senior members of uh, uh, the G7 you know, are six feet apart, uh, six feet apart of course. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's interesting they're not wearing masks. You know, they probably should have put some masks on just to make it even more entertaining. But um, nevertheless, the, you know, I can't imagine a better time to be invested in the metal sector. You know, we, you know, back in 20, uh, 2002, 2003, you know, I had predicted uh, a major, um, uh, what I called at that time, if some of you remember, generational change. And uh, that phrase was picked up um, uh, a few times by others, but uh, Nevertheless, you know, we saw a 10-year bull cycle uh, in metals that ended in uh, quite abruptly uh, in 2011, 2012, and we've now, you know, we were in a bear market for a good, you know, five, six years, and uh, um, you know, we're, we started turning things around in 2018. But this is the same phenomenon, the same cycle this, uh, uh, that occurred back in that 10-year cycle. That's just kind of repeating itself. But it, if you look at technicals. This is really the third wave of, of a 30-year cycle, and this next wave is going to be the biggest and strongest wave of this upcoming move. You know, we have seen the mining sector starved of capital for at least the last couple of decades, and when executives or when these mining companies have actually made investments, they've been criticized by Wall Street and Bay Street for making investments at, at the wrong time. And uh, you know, expecting that management teams, you know, can predict uh, the, the market uh, for some reason, and and uh, you know, they wanted to build and, and so on, and uh, um, you know, their timing might have been incorrect, and then shareholders may have lost money. But the thesis behind these investments in the mining sector have always been to supply the planet with the necessary metals that we need for the human race to do the things that we need to do, and um, we're seeing supply crunches in all mining right across the board, whether it's copper, whether it's silver, you know, uranium, you, you, you name it. Oil and gas even is, is another one where you've got the Americans and the Canadians now cutting off investment in the energy sector, you know, in favor of the new Green Deal, you know, which in itself is, is uh, you know, a little bit ludicrous. But, um, uh, you know, this, this cycle, you know, to change the energy uh, feed for the human race is a hundred year plan. It's not going to happen in 10 years. You know, or, or even 30 years, you know, to, to remove uh, fuel combustion cars from the streets uh, in, in 10 years is a farce. It's not going to happen. Even to do it in 20 years cannot happen. It'll take 50 years to change the energy grid that, we, that we're using currently uh, to supply the human race with the energy needs of the planet. But yet these politicians seem to think they can do it much more quickly, and, and that's going to cause huge inflation and huge strife uh, among the population of the planet. And you could read you know, these slides for yourself. I'm not going to sit here reading them. You know, we talk about solar panels. Um, uh, 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 you know, the governments around the world are, are, are pushing solar panels and, and, and other, you know, uh, uh, you know green energy. Uh, I, I've been quoted a number of times, uh, you know, about some of the stats I've thrown out there. But, you know, just think about, uh, there's no 2020 numbers I've seen yet. Um, uh, but the 2019 numbers, the auto ma uh, manufacturers worldwide produced 90 million cars in 2019. 
of which 5 million of those cars were electric vehicles. 80 million ounces of silver were consumed uh, over those 5 million cars. Can you imagine producing uh, you know, 10 million cars, you know, 20 million electric cars? There's 1.4 billion fuel combustion cars sitting on the surface of the earth right now. How many, how many years will it take to replace those cars at a rate of 5 million cars per year? It's not going to happen. You know, we need to be producing 50 or 100 million electric cars a year to meet the demands of the politicians, the, the G7 and the G20, to even meet, come close to what they're suggesting that we should be doing. How many, how many ounces of silver is that going to consume? How many pounds of copper? How much nickel? You know, lithium, you name it, right across the board. The mining sector cannot supply the amount of metal that's required to meet the new Green Deal. It just will not happen. It's impossible. You know, we need, as I've said a hundred times, a thousand times, we need triple digit silver, we need $10 copper, <coughs> we need $200 oil to really turn, try to feed this planet. We just, it's virtually impossible. Uh, this is quite an interesting. Um, slide here comparing 2020 to date. As many of you probably know, um, in March 10th, 2020 was the top of the NASDAQ, hit 5,000 points that year. And you see the mix of, of companies, you know, market cap of a little over 2 trillion. And um, over the next few years, by 2003, the market had dropped by 80 percent. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of the new bull cycle in metals. At the time, in 2000, gold was trading at about $250 an ounce. Uh, silver was about $5 an ounce. Uh, copper was $0.60 cents an ounce, or $0.60 cents a pound, pardon me. And um, over the next um, few years, uh, all this money that was invested in this group of companies all flowed into the mining sector because the, the you know people were financing uh, the dot-com bubbles, you know, business plans without any real, you know, uh, meat behind them, just ideas. People were throwing tens of millions of dollars at, at, at companies just, you know, that were just basically, you know, farcical, you know, companies. And, uh, and that's what's happening today. You know, we're seeing a repeat. The SPAC market, uh, uh, it, you know, is very much the same as the, the, the fuel cell market back in 2000 or, or the, the dot-com bubble. Many of you probably remember Y2K, you know, when, when the clock clicked over on December 31st, 1999, the world was going to end that, that night. Uh, you know, I, st I, I stayed up that night because I was, you know, I was so concerned, and I'm sure many of the people in this room probably stayed up that night as well. But, uh, you know, it, it was a funny time. But, uh, but it's exactly what's happening now. Um, you know, we're going to see a crack in this market. You know, when you have a nine trillion, almost ten trillion dollars of market cap among these these high tech leaders, you know, you know it is getting pretty silly, right? And and you look at the the um, market cap of the miners, you know, this is nutty. You know, you see the top fifty miners on the planet, you know, have a market cap of of one point two trillion, um, um, and uh, the top, you know, five high-tech companies have a market cap of just under nine trillion. If these 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 high these five high-tech companies wouldn't even exist without these fifty miners, you know, the, the, these mining companies need to stand up and and really tell their stories because the world would just stop dead without these mining companies. We couldn't exist as a human race without these mining companies. Yet money flows into the tech sector as if they're somehow, you know, uh, unique. This is a different, different environment. And, uh, uh, you know, and I've said a number of times as well, you know, you look at the silver sector, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, the silver sector has a, a total market cap of, of around $20 billion, which is in itself quite, you know, a, a bit of a joke. But, um, you know, Apple could fit the entire silver sector into its, uh, into its uh, balance sheet, you know, in, in, a, in a you know pretty in a, in a heartbeat, and they and they and I, I actually think that you know I'm not sure how many people have watched the movie I Robot or or you know there or even even uh, Terminator, you know where you've got you know high tech companies really running the planet and the human race is the parasite of the planet. Well, that's the direction of our current governments, right? You know they they think you know we're the parasites, right? 
and they're trying to eliminate uh, you know, the, 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 the energy grid that we're currently using and uh, you know, replacing with this new fallacy somehow you know, turning the planet into a green planet. But you know, if they get their way and we don't stand up for ourselves, these high-tech companies are going to own the mining sector. Right? Just like the sci-fi, just like Hollywood. Hollywood's been pushing this theme for 20 years, and that's the direction they're going. You know, the auto sector, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, as I said earlier, 5 million cars produced in 2019. Now, we had a bit of a dip in, you know, 2020, of course, due to COVID. You know, we saw that dip, you know, globally in, you know, on, in, in all, all metals. But that was, that 80 million uh, uh, ounces, it says 60 there, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the number is actually 80 million, but whether, whether it's 60 or 80, it doesn't really matter. But you know the trend is there, and you 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 do the math, divide it out by five million cars, and where are we going? Uh, yeah. And you see all the components in an electric car. This electric car has about a kilo of silver in it. That's there's about three times more silver in an electric car than there is in a fuel combustion car. And on Kitco this morning, I read an article on Kitco that uh, by 2022, um, this writer uh, out of out of the UK is predicting that uh, 140 million ounces will be consumed in the solar panel industry in 2022. We'll see if that number turns out to be accurate. But it's, it's been, a, been a bit of a flat line for the last couple of years. 2020 is a bit of an anomalous year. It's hard to say whether um, you know, that's going to you know, remain that way. But, uh, and there is thrifting going on, of course. You know, DuPont, the largest uh, uh, silver paste manufacturer, in the world is trying to uh, reduce the amount of silver because silver is actually the, the most expensive component in a silver cell or, or, or solar cell. Uh, so there will be thrifting, of course. But uh, you know, with the government's pushing this in, in this technology, um, it's only up for silver. So you've got two businesses. You've got the electrical vehicle industry consuming about you know a little less than 10 percent, uh, 800 million ounces of silver being produced a year by the mining sector, and uh, so a little bit less than 10 percent in, in uh, electric cars, uh, about 12 percent in, in, um, in um, uh, solar panels. You've got two fairly new industries. These industries have only been around for about, you know, like call it a decade, and they're consuming about 20 percent of the world uh, supply of silver. And you'll see on this slide here, you see silver peaked out at, at 880 million ounces in 2016, and last year it dropped below 800 million ounces. And that's this world supply of, of, of silver. We're consuming a billion ounces a year, and we're only producing, as, a, as an industry, less than 800 million ounces. You know, I don't know how that can continue. The only solution is higher prices. That's the fix. And, you, you know, you're there, there are assets around the planet that are low grade, you know, assets that uh, that, that just simply need higher metal prices. You're, you're not going to get the mining sector to invest the capital because they don't want to take the risk. They don't want to take the criticism from the banks or, or, or the investors. So they need higher prices for a long term sustainable period of time. It's just not a blip. You can't have silver blip to hundred dollars and stay there for six months or a year. You need, you know, five, ten years of consistently high metal prices, copper at eight to ten dollars, silver at, at triple digits, um, you know, zinc, you know, you name it. All these metals have to be at much, much higher metal prices to get the miners off their, you know, um, uh, butts to start putting money into the into these mines. Because it's not going to happen. You know, we're without higher metal prices. Some technologies we take for granted, and it's shocking. You know, I travel around the world. You know, uh, uh, I talk to investors and institutions, you know, on a regular basis, and people look at silver as a poor man's gold, and it's not. You know, and some people think silver will be a, a currency again. I don't believe that. Um, you know, gold could could be a currency, or it could be part of a new reset. Um, that's that's quite likely. I don't think silver will ever be there. Um, I don't think there's enough silver around to ever meet the currency, you know, um, uh, theories. Um, it, it's just simply not in, in enough supply. But these technologies that drive the planet, you know, you would not be here today without this very important metal. You know, your automobile, your refrigerator, your toaster, your ovens, all all the gadgets just simply wouldn't exist. And I've said you know, another, uh, other, other times that we're going to be mining waste dumps 
you know, give it 50 years and then we'll be going back and, and digging up all the refrigerators and TVs that we've been bearing over the last 100 years just looking for metal. And 10 rules of silver, you can read those for yourself, but, um, and that's really my presentation. As you see, like, I wrote down quite a few notes because there's a okay. couple of things I do want to follow up on. Okay. Right? But this is also supposed to be interactive, so if you have questions for, for Keith as well, make sure to raise your hand and we'll jump in there. And Why don't we start off with one, actually? Uh, I was wondering, Keith, uh, I heard you talking about uh, um, uh, the banks to put in out of the system for the silver production. Yeah. Well, it's not going to be first majestic. You know, we're too small. Um, you know, they, we need the mining sector as a whole to, you know, break away from the current pricing system that they're, we're currently using as a, as a group. And, and, you know, quite honestly, you know, it, it works very well. You know, for a mining company to produce a metal, uh, you know, where there's a system in place and, and uh, you know, we sell the metal and we get paid. And, 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 and uh, the banks you know, take the supply and they deliver it to the consumer and uh, it's worked like that for 30, 40 years. Um, but unfortunately, there's the evil side to that, right? There, there's the whole paper derivative side of that. Um, and, and, and that's where the regulators have kind of looked away. Um, you know, the system was not set up like that originally. It was set up really to allow um, the consumer and the, and the producer a mechanism to hedge over a period of time. It wasn't, it wasn't meant to, to have a leveraged system where, where um, you know, the, the consumer or, um, can, can actually go in there and, and try to manipulate price. But unfortunately, that's what's happened, right? So you have silver trading a billion ounces a day on the paper market, and the miners are producing 800 million ounces a year. So in this last uh, Reddit you know, run-up, I mean, we saw it quite clearly, and it was quite shocking and uh, very disappointing that the regulators let this happen. But you actually had one of the regulators on, on, on CNBC actually um, stand up for themselves and say they were doing the right thing. And, and when you have the government saying that, it just shows you that the system is so corrupt. And, and the, you know, you had the chairman of the CFTC you know, saying on CNBC that we were successful, we successfully uh, squashed, or he used another word, uh, uh, this, uh, the price, because if we let the silver price continue to move, it would have created severe damage in the system. You know, what is he talking about, right? Uh, and then the, and the, uh, the interviewer, unfortunately, did not press him to ask him really what he was referring to. Um, so, you know, when you have the CFTC saying that they were able to fix the system, um, in order for the price not to go higher. So you have a regulator that's concerned about price. You know, why is a regulator concerned about price, right? Um, it tells you there's something wrong in the system. So who's actually pulling the strings, right? So the banks are pulling the strings. So the miners are selling to the banks. The banks know what the miners are going to be supplying them, and they hedge against that sale. So, you know, if, if you've got Sony, you know, that orders, you know, 50 million ounces of silver from HSBC, um, you know, at 27 bucks, let's say, um, it's, it's in the best interest of HSBC to, to, to keep the price within a reasonable range so they don't lose money on that trade, right? Uh, and that's what they do. Uh, and, and when that whole Reddit trade came in, um, uh, JP Morgan shorted, well, it's actually BlackRock, that shorted 200 million ounces of silver that day, um, uh, and they're allowed to do it. If you and me did that, we would be arrested, right? Because it, it's clearly, it's in the COMEX uh, uh, regulations. We have a maximum of 1,500 contracts on the short side for a normal retail investor. Um, even First Majestic couldn't do that. Um, our, our maximum is 1,500 contracts. And, uh, but these banks are exempt traders, and there's no limit to what their short positions are. So they, can, they just sat there in the market and wrote all the contracts they wanted to write, and, and they said it was to save the market, 
and then the, and the next day, you, you saw a couple of institutions out of New York, there was one in New York and one in Toronto that I saw interviewed on CNBC, uh, asking the regulators to look into the right of traders uh, that somehow these young uh, millennials should, should be not allowed to invest in the stock market because they don't know what they're doing. They're unsophisticated investors. So there should be rules and regulations in place to prevent these retail investors to go in and buy you know, um, these positions. And of course, they were talking about GameStop and, you know, and silver was in that discussion as well. So you've got a whole group on the, on the short side of the marketplace that lose money you know, when, when these you know, Reddit crowds come into a market. And the silver market is very thin. So um, yeah, nevertheless, it, uh, I probably went on a little bit too far. But. I'm a little bit emotional when it comes to that kind of thing. <laughs> no, I think that, you know, being, that being an extra, I, I used to be on the floor of the stock exchange. Like I, I traded for three national banks in, in the 80s, from uh, 84 to 89, and uh, um, I, I was uh, called the Grinder. That was my nickname. And uh, um, the reason why they called me that is because I would sit on the bid and offer. You know, I was, uh, 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 and, I, and I was a board marker for a couple of years, and, and then I went on to the floor. One of the banks hired me, and, and uh, I would be on the bid and ask of a market, and I wouldn't let the market move. Right? And uh, no matter what guys came in and bought or what guys came in and sold, I'd be the market maker for that stock. And I did that for a variety of stocks that you know were... Um, uh, anyway, so I, at the end of the day, I'd have this big stack of uh, pink and uh, 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 green tickets. And, uh, and, and I probably have, you know, at least two or three times more tickets than anyone else in my section on the board. And I, so I got this nickname, The Grinder. And uh, so, look, I know how markets work, and, uh, and I know how they can be manipulated. And uh, anyways. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I got to follow up now to copper versus silver. It feels a bit like the California pistachio versus the California walnut. Yeah. You're stealing the limelight from each other. Right, silver is more of an investment, more of a precious metal. Nobody really looks at it like you want it them. You want them to look at like a, a base metal, like a commodity that's actually being used in the industry. Yeah. Like, does silver have a branding and image issue? You know, I think it does. Um, that's a very good point, Kai. Because um, uh, I, as I said earlier, I think people look at silver as a poor man's gold, and I don't look at it like that at all. Um, um, it is a very strategic commodity. Um, uh, my two favorite metals are silver and copper. Um, you know, I think everyone should have a good silver uh, stock or a couple or a couple of good copper stocks. Uh, you know, of course, gold is our favorite, but um, uh, um, gold seems to be in abundance, quite frankly. Um, you know, at First Majestic, we could, we could load our portfolio up with gold, gold mines, um, but try to find a good copper mine or try to find a good silver mine. They're really hard to find. Why is that? Is that just a lack of exploration or is it just a lack of just metal? Yeah, yeah, well, silver, you know, look, look, look at my presentation. You know, the trading, the, the mining ratio for silver is 7 to 1. So for every one ounce of gold, seven ounces of silver are being mined. And, uh, you know, they, the scientists say there's, you know, 15 or 16 ounces of uh, silver, you know, in, in the ground for every one ounce of gold. But we, we've, I put the first Majestic together in 2002, and even then it was 12 to 1. Interesting. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to raise their hands, by the way. Okay. Adam and then... Yeah, well, the, 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 there's a lunch meeting, uh, they, they, when the investors as well, you know, the, the investors, you know, the, it tends to be an older crowd, and uh, um, you, know, you know, I grew up, you know, uh, uh, with metals, and, and I, I've been doing this for 35 years, and you know, my, my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, you know, I open my safe up, and you know, she and she sees the silver and the gold, and she comes and touches it, and we talk about it, and so she's educated. I'm educating her about the importance of metal and so on. I don't think that happens in a lot of families. Um, and, and a lot of families don't educate their children in geology and engineering, and it's a huge problem. You know, we have, you know, in First Majestic, we have a huge talent base of older people, you know, of my age and, and, and older. And, uh, and, and there's no, in a lot of cases, young people aren't coming in to, to so soak up that knowledge base. And, and uh, it is a huge problem. Um, 
and, and I'm not sure what the solution is, but you know, for us personally, and I, I think generally speaking, I think the miners know that. Um, uh, you know, we have hired you know consistently, you know, entire graduating classes from the universities, the two universities in in Mexico that we uh, know, uh, 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 the main university in Guanajuato and the main one in Durango, and we hired 20 to 30 engineers. Uh, Per year, and these are young kids, you know, in their mid twenties, you know, coming, you know, they grew up with iPads, and, and uh, uh, they come to the mines, and, and and they bring ideas. And I'm actually quite optimistic about the mining sector. I think the mining sector is getting a lot better, a lot more efficient, and that, you know, it's much different. The mining sector today, compared to ten years ago, or compared to twenty years ago, is a much different uh, business, and I think it's even going to be much more different. Uh, because there are technologies out there, and then we are bringing young people, you know, to the sector and, are, and, and that are educated differently with high technology and so on. But it is a problem uh, that because you know people, you know, want to become doctors and lawyers and, and and so on. But you know, I think the mining sector just has to do a better job in promoting themselves and bringing young talent to the table. And it's going to take the entire sector to work together to accomplish that. Cedric, you had a question as well. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit nutty on that, right? Like, I, 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 back in 2010, 2011, you know, when, when silver was hitting 50 bucks an ounce, gold was 1800 you know, I, I would have never predicted silver would have corrected down to $13 an ounce and gold would have corrected. Um, uh, and, I, and I even thought, and I was doing interviews at that time, uh, as I always do, and I was saying that the, the miners are going to become the banks of the future. And I honestly believed it, but um, today I don't believe that. I think the I think the high tech companies are going to become the miners of the future. I, I think the high tech industry is going to own the entire mining sector in ten or twenty years. Gerne. Gerne. So he's asking, there's two, two sides actually. There's one, the bank's making price forecasts for silver, but then on the other hand, there's manipulation going on. Like how do you see it happening or actually meeting at some point, like both points, like the forecasts and the price and the manipulation meeting each other. So they, let's say BlackRock, uh, uh, trying as an example, predicts, I'm not sure, not sure what they predict, $35 probably or something, whatever, it doesn't really matter, that they, like, the silver actually gets the $35. The, does the question make sense? Did I, trans I tried to translate it properly. I well, you know, I, I, I highly doubt, because I used to work for the banks, right? I worked for three of the largest national banks in Canada. You know, I doubt whether there's a mandate at the banks to manipulate anything. You know, I, I just, I, I don't think, you know, I, you know, I can't imagine Jamie Dimon phoning down to his trading desk and saying, sell 200 million ounces of silver. I, I don't think that happens. But I do think what happens is that the traders that are managing the book, right? Because these traders have a job. Like they're, 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 their job is to make money for the bank, right? So, and they're, so if they've just sold 50 million ounces to uh, uh, Tesla, um, and so now they're short, he's respond, that trader's responsible for that position, right? And his bonuses are getting paid according to that trade. So it's in that trader or that trader's, that desk that made that trade, it's their responsibility to make sure that they make money on that trade. So, so they'll do whatever they can. And they'll, they'll even pick up the phone and call another bank and say, hey, can you help me out on this trade? And, uh, and they'll work together. And, and, and we've seen you know, many of the cases that have come up um, um, you know, b between the banks and the fines that these, these banks have gotten. And, and I'm, sh I'm pretty certain um, that the ex senior executives of the boards of directors of these banks have no clue what these traders are doing. But the traders are just simply acting in the, what they think is the best interest of, of themselves and their trading desk and their book, and they're managing their book. Whether you, know, whether you call it manipulation or not, you know, we use the word manipulation a little bit too freely, um, uh, uh, and I think maybe we probably shouldn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's more managing your position. Um, it's just like if you go and buy you know, a big position in a junior mining stock, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and the, and the, and the junior mining stock is down 30%, 40%. Are you going to step in there and try to help it out and try to support it, right? And you, you might, right? I would. 
and I've done it many times. So is that called manipulation or is that called managing your book? I want to talk SPACs real quick, actually, because we've seen a couple interesting pop up here in the mining space as well. Cisco Green Development, Ivanhoe has launched a SPAC, RCF just launched one as well. Do you see them coming into the silver space as well as part of the green, green movement? Well, High Crops is a SPAC, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. that's true, actually. High Crop mines out of Nevada. Yeah, yeah, they're almost bankrupt, but, but. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless. Well, we've seen it because with um, Mount Green, uh, on the end of the earth side, because all the SPAC investments happen downstream at the charging points and charging stations, but not upstream. Do you see money eventually moving upstream? From where? From, from the investment community in general. So far, they're only investing, let's say, charge point, blink. They're buying the end product, mm -hmm. but they're not looking or investing into what's actually going into that end product to make hap the electrification happen. So. Well, it's all headline driven, right? You know, the, these, you know, uh, you know, the, the money will go where, where people are making money. So, so you know, where, you know, right now the the trade is it really in the high tech. You know, the the fangs, uh, the the Nasdaq, the S and P. You know, that's where the money is. There's no money in buying a mining stock, really. So, you know, people in this room will buy they buy you know uh, their mining stocks for specific reasons um, because we're all bulls and we like the sector and so on and. Uh, you know, many of us will own a stock for five, ten years just because you know we we're, we're, we like the sector. But that's very unusual. This is a very unusual group. You know, people, generally speaking, uh, most of the money just chases uh, momentum, and and we've seen a ten-year bull market. Um, you know, in the S and P and then the Nasdaq and so on. And uh, you know, when that bull market ends, like it did in two thousand, and that's why I opened the presentation up with that phrase or that that discussion. Um, the market will crack, uh, and I, I don't want to predict a crash. I don't know when it's going to happen, but you know, you really need a, a, a change of flow to really come into this sector to really change uh, this sector in a big way. And, and what's the catalyst between behind that flow? It's just it, it's just going to it's going to be the institutions waking up and saying, "Geez, we can't make money buying Tesla anymore. You know, we can't make money buying Apple anymore." When they make that realization, that money will go into Newmont, it'll go into Barrick, it'll go into the First Majestics, and it'll start flowing down into the mid-tiers, and then it'll go into the juniors. And we'll go into another 10-year bull market, which I, th I, I think we've already started. I think we're probably in a, you know, the second year of a 10-year cycle. And uh, you know, if we see similar types of moves that we saw back in uh, the last bull market, where we saw gold go up 800% and silver go up 1,000%, uh, you know, those are pretty substantial moves if you use $13 silver and call it $1,000 gold as your bottoms. How scared are you of a substitution effect at some point? Once silver hits the triple digits and you say we need 20% of our production, at least for the EVs and solar panels, they'll come up with a new idea. How, how, how scared no, are you? Yeah, I don't think so. You know, you, you, know, you got, um, there's 6,000 batteries in a Tesla automobile. And, and, um, it's a very complicated system. You've got this very sophisticated computer managing these 6,000 batteries. And uh, the responsibility of that computer is to make sure that these batteries don't heat up and the car doesn't blow up and kill the family driving this automobile. So uh, there's, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a big interest in making sure that this car doesn't blow up. So you're going to use the best technology possible to make sure there's not a serious accident. You're, you're not going to take silver out of there and replace with aluminum. Right, it's just you know, or or, or zinc or, or 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 some other metal. It's just not going to happen. You know, you need high speed, you know, um, uh, you know, communication between the computer and those batteries. Okay. You know, I, I look at copper as the road, and silver as the glue. There you go. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. And uh, so feel free to ask any more questions. By the way, if you have any. Um, so overall, silver production is an interesting one as well. So substitutes for silver. Recycling is another one. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you see that factor? And we had an interesting discussion on SF Online the other day mm -hmm. that recycling, especially from car batteries, is too small right now. Yeah. Do you see that having an impact at some point? You know, in, in 2011, when silver hit 50 bucks, uh, recycling hit 250 million ounces that year. Um, and 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 the, you know, we don't know for certain, but you know, a lot of the silver came from you know old old ladies kind of collections, right? Um, or old family collections, you know, um, silverware, jewelry, um, and, and there was, it was a kind of a one-time event. Um, so, y y you know, you're probably going to need something much greater than that, probably 80 to to $100 to see uh, recycling hit 
that kind of number again. Uh, annual recycling right now is around 125 million ounces. Most of that comes from hospital film, believe it or not, because um, there's still a lot of hospitals uh, around the world that uh, use, um, you know, the old films. Uh, they're not moved over to, uh, um, you know, the electronic uh, X-ray machines yet. Um, and, and that market is slowly dying because most hospitals are moving over to more modern uh, technologies. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see where recycling is going to come from. You know, in, in a device like this, for example, you know, there's these technology, these tech companies are very good at building these machines. There's several layers of, of, of boards in here with the metal embedded so precisely, uh, it's almost impossible to get it out. There's, I know of three companies uh, in, in Canada, uh, two of which are bankrupt, um, using two different technologies, uh, both unsuccessful. A third company is, is um, um, uh, I personally think they're on the brink of uh, bankruptcy, I don't know, uh, but I don't think their technology is working that well either. Um, China, as many of you probably know, as of January 1st, uh, 2019, stopped the importation of all uh, computer waste from North America. Um, uh, uh, I think it was 20. I think it was 2019. It could have been 2020, but they shut down due to the pollution that was causing. For you to extract uh, the metal out of these phones, it creates so much pollution um, that the Chinese ended up shutting down these uh, uh, smelters. Uh, so now a lot of this computer waste has no home. So there's a lot of computer waste being accumulated uh, in, in North America. Um, and, and, and you can't get a permit uh, in, in North America to get a smelter because you need zero uh, waste. Um, uh, and, and it's virtually impossible to do. So ultimately, there, I'm assuming there will be a technology that will be able to get the, the metals out of these computers and these cell phones. But so far, it's not economic. Not tomorrow. Yeah, that's for it's sure. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, you're you're, you're going to need much higher prices. Yeah. yeah. And one of the themes of the conference actually was inflation and the inflation fears and investing in gold and silver as well. Um, you run a bullion store at First yeah. Majestic. Right? Yeah. I'm really curious how that's been going and developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, we now have a hundred ounce bar, which um, I was surprised that is selling so well. Uh, we're, we're we're about five hundred percent higher metal sales over our website than we were a year ago. Uh, we're selling I don't know probably a thousand ounces a day right now. It's it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and but my, mind you, it's at a at a uh, a premium of four dollars an ounce. It's, it is quite the premium because yeah. I didn't buy it the other day. Because I was looking at this oh. is too much. It's like, I'm not willing to pay this. You should have asked me to, well, you live in Canada. so you Yeah, I'll just, just come by the office. You can just walk in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, it, it's interesting. Do you see a bit of a reaction in this in the sales volume? I don't know how close you, you monitor the sales. but Every day. Like, so when silver jumps up to $25, CPI numbers come out at 6.2%, do you see a bit of an uptick in sales? Yeah, look, you know, the people that buy silver, they're, they're, they're retail investors, generally speaking, right? So, so they do chase. Um, you know, when things are dropping, they tend to stop buying, and then when things are running, they tend to, uh, they, you know, like Nikki's presentation earlier today. You know, it's just, uh, you know, we're, you know, you, people always buy at the wrong time, right? It's just natural. See, now I have a problem actually, because I wanted to go another direction with the next question, but you just <laughs> opened a can of worms. So always at the wrong time, because I made a note because you mentioned producers are investing always at the wrong time. Yeah. You're a producer. Okay, um, as an investor, like I want producers actually to grow right now because debt is dirt cheap. I want you to take on cheap money to, to grow. Mm -hmm. do, do you see that? Like I don't see it in the sector happening. You you made you bought uh, Jared Canyon, mm -hmm. but you didn't take on a lot of debt if I remember correctly sure. for that, right? Do you we, see we that happening shares. in the future? So it's more of a first majestic slash more of a general market comment. But do you see that happening? Shouldn't producers actually do that and, and miners take on cheap debt to start growing, or is that the wrong way? Yeah, I think there's a nervousness in the sector. I, you know, I, I actually believe that the, most executives in the mining sector don't believe that the current market is going to exist very much longer. You know, you, you see the executives of, that are running these gold companies; they're still using $1,200 gold. In some cases, $1,400. But um, you know, you rarely see anyone. I, I actually, I've never seen anyone use $1,800 gold um, in any valuation. So that tells you the senior executives of the major gold producers don't believe that the current market is going to exist. So, you know, if they don't believe that, why would they go take out debt? Right? You know, if, if they thought gold was going to be $3,000 in a year or two years, which I think it's going to be, then, yeah, you take on debt and then leverage it up, right? But no, they don't do it. 
It's interesting where that because they're so close to the market as well. Well, so where that disconnect is coming from. That's right. Right. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Yeah. And maybe one of my last questions, actually, as well, like as I mentioned, like the silver has been going up back up to twenty five dollars. Is that just a recovery because of what we've seen in February or is that a, a new leg up? And of course, what is driving it? You know, I, I tend to be an optimist and, um, you, know, I, you know, I've asked, been asked this question a couple of times, but um, I think that there is a game change happening. Um, I just feel there, there, there's a vibe. There's, a, there, there, there's you know, something going on in the marketplace where we're seeing more money flowing into the, into the precious metals market. Well, actually, the mining sector as a whole. You know, we've seen uranium go. We've seen virtually every metal go. Even, even gold at 1850, it's not bad. You know, it, it's, uh, um, but I'm just seeing more money flowing into the system. And I think there is a belief out there that um, there is going to be a crack in the system. The governments are going to continually print money. Uh, I think that there was a view maybe six months ago that the governments were going to, you know, start uh, um, changing their ways. But um, I think now uh, most investors are realizing that uh, there, there's no end game in sight. Um, the governments have to continually uh, continually do what they have been doing for the last couple of decades and uh, um, no one sees what what the end is going to look like so so there's a place the only really place to be is in the metals and I, I think people are waking up to that fantastic do we have any last questions cool yeah I can if you look at what the cost of mining are doing right now they're starting to put quite a bit of money into regional exploration into new new areas and really can't get their budgets on the regional exploration and higher risk ventures because they realize that they have issues in the supply chain on the uh, copper side. Silver is really the same thing. It feels like, like say, business strategy for First Majestic, there's a lot of acquiring ounces as opposed to the greenfield exploration. Do you see in the future First Majestic or the Pan Americans shifting that business strategy to go look to new areas, say, outside of Mexico? Well, you know, it, it could be my fault, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a geologist, so, you know, and I'm more of a finance guy, and you know, I like buying stuff, and I like I like building things, so, um, uh, you know, we we um, you know we do have a large large exploration program. Don't get don't get me wrong. You know, we have 27 drill rigs active. We got, you know, I, th I think uh, 300,000 meters of drilling planned for 2022. We're doing something like 220,000 meters of drilling in 2021. Uh, these are big programs. So we've got 200 geologists that work for the company. Um, so of course we take you know, uh, exploration very seriously, but you don't see us news releasing drill results. Um, you're not, no one's going to convince me internally to ever news release a drill result because you know, I don't think a drill result means dick, you know, quite frankly. Um, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe 100 drill results would mean something. And and, the, and, and we have a, a system in place where we put out 43 101s, and that's when we are able to talk about our resource development and our success and exploration. You know, it, you know, it, you know we, do, we do quarterly updates, and, you know, we, we might touch on geology a little bit, but, but re it's rare. And, and that's really kind of me. Um, um, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that are run by you know, different executive teams, and they and they that's all they talk about is geology. Um, uh, the producers I'm, I'm referring to, uh, but um, you know, as long as metal prices are 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 buoyant where they are now, as long as the money is available for the mining sector, which it is now, uh, the mining sector is probably better capitalized today than it has been, you know, probably in my career. Um, there's more money available for good mining companies, to, uh, uh, and that's good. That's great news. Um, uh, so I think you're going to see uh, increased uh, exploration right across the globe, uh, at least for the next couple of years, as long as these, these markets stay intact. Fantastic. Well, Keith, we're out of time. Okay. Really, really appreciate it. This was our closing keynote of Deutsche Goldmess. I can't believe it. Two days and we're done. Uh, it went by quick. I hope everybody had a great time. And uh, we hope we put on a conference that was of interest. We had fantastic keynote speakers. I hope you took in a lot of information. Next, Canadian philanthropist. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, I really appreciate everybody coming out. This was a trip. Uh, we're here in Frankfurt. We've had international guests from Switzerland, from Netherlands as well. Uh, really, really appreciate Canadians, obviously. Uh, the companies were all out of Canada. So really, really appreciate everybody coming out. 
Uh, wish everybody the best of luck for the rest of the year. Looks like we might be, uh, you know, dodging tax loss season this year. So fingers crossed for that. And uh, good luck and safe travels home. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, all the best. Thank you, Thank you so much.